A very good morning to all of you. Um, thank you very much for uh, attending our session. Um, we are really looking forward to, to your participation um, in this session. Um, on behalf of the speakers, a uh, warm welcome also to Sherry, uh, who is joining us later on a recorded, uh, recorded version of her paper. The topic of today's session is driving inclusive growth and enhancing intra-African trade through the service sector development. So the purpose of our session today, as you have seen on the program, is a joint effort to offer you some insights into the work that the ICTSD, the International Center on Trade and Sustainable Development, and the Northwest University, and specifically the trade research entity in Potchefstroom in South Africa, have been conducting into the services sector. And also the potential that this sector has to give for greater momentum to the potential of economies, and specifically the economies in Southern Africa. Services, as we have heard in several sessions in this public forum, are the most important economic activity in, in a large majority of countries. And when we measure the overall contribution, it's more than 70% of GDPs on average in the world, 60% of employment, and 40 to 50% of world trade if we measure, measure this in value added. In Africa, this average contribution of services of exports to the total of a total of exports is about 28%, which mostly contr is contributed by the tourism sector. So, to so today, our focus will be on five different issues that will be presented by very ex experts in the field of services. And the first presentation will be by Sherry Stevenson. She is a senior fellow of the ICTSD. And Sherry will talk to us about the importance of services exports and its role in the new economy in the 21st century, especially from an African perspective, and the experiences and success stories of services exports companies and sectors. And then most importantly, if we see these services sectors um, enhance and, and be best practices, what are the fundamentals behind, the, behind this advantage that these services sectors have in being and becoming successful? And then also I think very importantly is the, the role of the government. And I think some of you might be interested in specifically the role of the government in enhancing uh, services in, the specific, in, in specific countries. Our second presentation, and I'm, I'm now also introducing our speakers and also the five topics. Um, the second speaker is, is uh, Ju uh, Judith Fezihai. Uh, she is the Senior Manager for Trade and Development at the ICTSD. And, and Judith will map services inputs into the multiple changes of global value chains. Global value chains also a very important um, new generation issue um, that we are all very much involved with um, in terms of our research. Then our third speaker, um, here on my uh, right hand side, further right, is the ambassador um, Moshi Kayu. He is uh, the former permanent representative of the permanent mission of Lesotho in Geneva. And uh, Ambassador Kayo will talk to us about the effective market access for services from a domestic side as well as from global value chains. And then on my left hand side, uh, Deborah Foris, the managing director of the ICTSD, specifically focusing on the um, importance and also the challenges and, and challenges for, for the different um, contributors to services in terms of the regulations on a global, on a domestic um, side as well, as well as internationally. And then last but not least, on my right-hand side, my colleague, uh, Professor uh, Sonia Greater, Associate Professor at the Northwest University, and Sonia will be addressing us on the services sector, the supply chain constraints, as well as what can be overcome, what, what can be done to overcome those barriers. <laughs> 
thank you very much, and um, I think we can start now. I keep it short so that we have enough time for the speakers. We'll give the speakers about 10 minutes, and then hopefully we will have enough time for some engagement and some discussion on these matters. Thank you very much, and welcome. Good morning. I'm pleased to join you today you for please the distance put on your and to speak on services exports for growth and development, the experience of Africa in exporting services. Services are behind the new economy and our reality in the 21st century in various ways. Allow for the operation of global value chains, which now make up around 80% of world trade by an UNCTAD estimate, and which means that what makes value chains function, that is logistics, transport services, and communication services in particular, as well as efficient border operations, are much more important than tariffs and constitute key factors in trade competitiveness. African economies already export services, but they could do much more. Contrary to what is widely perceived, African economies, including the least developed, are actively engaged in producing and exporting services. One third of African countries are already net exporters of services. But understanding the opportunities that services offer through looking at the lens of experience of a few African countries and how they develop their services exports may help us understand how other countries can engage more effectively in internet. We can do this through a, now a case study volume that was published by the African Union Commission two years ago in 2015, which contains a, five case studies of services exporters uh, geographically and sectorally diverse. This project was supported by four international donors and was published in 2015 and available online here at this reference. Studied were Air Transport Services Ethiopia, Banking Services Nigeria, BPO and ICT Services Senegal, Cultural Services Burkina Faso, and Education Services for Uganda. These were to promote the knowledge and understanding of services trade and better way in Africa, uh, to provide more concrete information on these specific services sectors and how they successfully became um, exporters at the regional and often international market, and um, to basically highlight how even least developed economies can become successful exporters in the African context speak mainly in this panel on the outcomes from these case studies. Um, and I want to highlight five different outcomes which I think are really particularly interesting and illuminating and can constitute lessons learned for others. The first one is that most export success in Africa has been directed first and primarily at the regional market and then gone beyond. Uh, all of these services that sectors that were studied, they first began their concentration at the regional level. But in some cases, when they became big enough and successful enough, they went beyond African borders. For in the case of BPO ICT exports from Senegal, which now go to France and other Francophone locations, air transport services, Ethiopia, which are now directed all over the world and have destinations in Europe, North and South America, and South and East Asia, Banking services from Nigeria, which are present in international operations in six countries outside of Africa. And cultural and education services from Burkina Faso and Uganda, which are enjoyed by a few non-African tourists and non-African students. Secondly, successful exports of these services in one mode of supply, which began as one mode of supply, have generated services exports in complementary modes of supply. This is a particularly fascinating finding. Um, examples of this. Exports of higher education services by Ugandan universities through attracting foreign students from primarily Africa and some from beyond has led to three Ugandan universities establishing branch campuses abroad. So here, mode two has led to mode three. <laughs> 
Um, exports of air transport services by Ethiopian Airlines has led to the establishment of training schools within the country for pilots and air transport personnel from all over Africa. So here, mode one, excellence, has led to mode two. Uh, thirdly, exports of banking services by Nigeria has led to the establishment of foreign branches and subsidiaries within Africa and abroad with the accompanying movement of skilled Nigerian personnel in the banking sector. So here, mode one, export success, has led to modes three and four. And lastly, exports of BPO ITC services by Senegal has led to six subsidiaries being established in other African locations. So here, mode one has again led to mode three. This really underscores the importance of having policies in place that favor modal neutrality both at home and in the export markets of trading partners. Certain factors have laid the success for initial advantage in these successful export sectors. In many cases, these initial factors were leveraged into bigger export growth and success over time. The initial advantage in Senegal was the presence of skilled entrepreneurs which had a good connection and knowledge of the French market. Initial advantage in Burkina Faso was that they the country has always had very creative artists and musicians and a historic tradition of cultural activities. Initial advantage in Ethiopia was as a first mover, where the Ethiopian Airlines was established early on in 1945 and served as already early on a hub for geograph a geographical hub for East Africa. First mover advantage in Uganda was the establishment of Makerere University again very early on, which was transformed in 1935 to become a center for higher education in East Africa. And lastly, the initial advantage in Nigeria was the inflow of foreign exchange from petroleum, which provided a surplus of capital on the domestic market, which could be drawn upon for investment abroad. Policies were essential in helping these initial advantages to grow. And conversely, the lack of a supportive government policy served to hamper further export growth. So if we look at the government policies that supported the expansion of BPO ITC sector in Senegal, these uh, were present in the form of the creation of training institutes and training programs for engineers. In the area in Burkina Faso, the government has all for a long-standing period of time provided financial support for the cultural services industries, and in Ethiopia uh, for air transport, and in the banking services for Nigeria, the governments created an appropriate regulatory framework within which these activities could flourish, and in the case of Ethiopia, liberalize the air transport sector. For Uganda, the government identified the sector as a policy priority. So this is services exports have grown with impressive success when there have been proactive and directed government policies. And some of these policies have included positive incentives, such as subsidies, training programs, and tax incentives, which were specific, but also more general policies, such as key trade policy decisions to liberalize specific sectors, to engage in cooperative agreements at the regional level, such as air transport agreements, or to generate a regulatory framework through regulatory reform. So the different types of sectors have benefited from different types of policies, but the key was to Lastly, what the case study volume underlines is that the future expansion of successful services exports can be threatened by weaknesses of other service sectors. And when the other services are not at the level to be able to provide the needed support basis for the successful export sector, then the growth of the successful exports can also be reduced. And this gives examples of how this can happen. In the BPO ICT in Senegal, the lack of a sufficient supply of human resources in the form of trained engineers and computer specialists was a weakness in the education sector that had to be overcome. In air transport services, the weakness of the financial services market means there's not a lot of local capital which to allow Ethiopian Airlines to raise, to take out loans and expand its operations domestically and internationally. 
in Uganda, the regulatory framework for the telecom sector means that there is a lack of availability of a low-cost internet backbone for the universities, which constrains the expansion of web-based, um, internet-based education program exports. And lastly, in Burkina Faso, the weak infrastructure in the tourism sector makes it difficult to attract larger audiences to the outstanding cultural fairs and shows. So this is really important because it means that one must view the entire services environment as a determinant of the sustainability of export success, not just the particular All the case studies underline these key factors necessary for export success in services in Africa. Um, and underline the fact that supply-side conditions and appropriate supportive policies are really key for export success. Vision. African economies have great potential in services. More efficient services are the basis for sustained economic growth and participation in supply chains. And services offer great opportunities for boosting regional trade in Africa, but we need a focus on both market access but also on supply constraints and supportive policies which will allow services to play a catalytic role to achieve these. <clears throat> okay. Um, I, ho I hope you could hear this um, recording well. Um, so we're moving on to our second presentation, and um, it is Judith who is now going to entertain us on the uh, global value chains and the role that services play as inputs into global value chains. Thank you, Judith. Thank you. Good morning. I'm going to discuss a bit the role of services as inputs in global value chains. Okay. So why do we care? Uh, services account for around 20% of world trade, um, for the value of world trade, but actually in value-added terms, they account for almost 50% of the value of world. And that's why, um, and the reason why, it's because basically services are increasingly embodied and embedded in goods uh, traded across the world. Um, so if we, if we try to look, to map the role of services in global value chains, we see that they fit into a value chains in different ways. First of all, they can fit into specific sections of a value chain. For example, here, technical testing and analysis services, which are more related to the production nodes of a value chain. Um, advertising is specifically related to marketing. Um, other type of services are more uh, of um, across the sector uh, inputs in value chains. For example, ICT, financial services, or transportation will fit across multiple nodes in a value chain. And then finally, some specific tasks within value chains are actually services related. So if we think of R&D or distribution or aftermarket services, we are really talking about services activities and not manufacturing. The increasing role of services in global value chains has led to the terminology of servicification of manufacturing, which literally refers to the increasing role of services in the manufacturing processes across the world. So I want to show you an example. This is a Swedish original equipment manufacturer, Sandvik Tooling. They are involved in the production of equipment for the agricultural, mining um, and construction sectors. This is the number of services a company like Sandvik Tooling um, would acquire from third-party suppliers uh, on an average, for an average production process. And these are more than 40 services types. They go from services that you would take for granted, such as R&D or logistics or uh, security services, to other services that may not be so um, immediate when we think of a manufacturing company, such as educational services, video and communication services, uh, placement of personnel, or uh, photographic services. These are the services offered by a company like Sandvik Tooling when they actually supply the equipment. And you can find that there are around 14, 15 services in this category. So these are literally services supplied by different um, units within the same multinational. 
So this is happening actually across global value chains and across the sectors. So for example, uh, suppliers of uh, apparel and textile uh, in Asia are now supplying a whole range of services together with the products that go with logistics, product design, uh, marketing, um, and, and transportation. Um, so in, in actual terms, some of these companies have now become service providers rather than purely manufacturing companies. So what is driving the servicification of manufacturing? There are a number of elements that are important at the firm level. So one element is obviously the need to generate more profits and to move into more profitable activities. And that's the case, for example, with aftermarket services. If we think of a car manufacturers, and the reason why a car manufacturer would be so tied up with the um, warranty system and the repair and maintenance, it's because it's one, actually one of the most profitable segments of the operations. Other issues are more related with the strategy for diversification and differentiate uh, products, and that's obviously in the most co in the most competitive markets. Services ser literally serve the function of um, uh, marketing and uh, segmenting and segmenting uh, markets. Um, uh, some services are a response to external regulations, and that's the case, for example, with the recycling services to meet new environmental regulations. Um, and then part of the specification of manufacturing has to do with technology and modularization. So the increasing uh, importance of communication and transport innovations um, and increased formalization and codification of services has actually allowed uh, the increased tra tradability of services, which has made it easy to, uh, easier to actually outsource and offshore some of these services um, on the side of the multinational companies and lead firms. So why does it matter? First of all, because in terms of value, it has become ex increasingly important in terms of world trade. Um, um, this is also implies that services are now critical to increase firm productivity and value chain competitiveness, especially for the LDCs and low-income countries trying to upgrade in global value chains. Um, the other reason is that if you look at the value-added composition of global value chains, actually some of the most profitable activities are service-related and not manufacturing-related. So I want to give you an example. This is the value-added composition of uh, Nokia 95. Uh, it was an estimate done in 2007, but it's very difficult to find this type of detailed value-added accounting um, in, in uh, value chain research. So if you look at the composition of value-added, actually you'll find that a company like Nokia is accruing around 50% uh, of the value-added for the production or marketing of this phone. Um, Nokia at the time was doing very little manufacturing, so literally all of this uh, value added is related to activities related to product design, branding, uh, licenses, IP, and not really related to manufacturing. If you're looking at something like processors, processors are, account for only 6% of the total value added of this phone. And more interesting, if you look at uh, assembly, which is more, more often located in countries like China, that actually accounts for only 2% of the value uh, of this phone. So when we talk about upgrading, most often we are actually talking upgrading into services related tasks within value chains rather than manufacturing or assembly. It also matters for uh, job creation, and that's particularly important for many African countries. So it was estimated that in the South African automotive sectors, in terms of exports, um, while in 2001, for one uh, job directly created by, the export by this export sector, um, one uh, job was indirectly created uh, by the sector. By 2013, for every job created by the sector, there were other three jobs which are uh, indirectly which were indirectly related to, um, created by the sector. And these are all uh, jobs created in the services industry. They are related with the repair, with the maintenance, with the transport, with the leasing, with the finance, with all the services that are related to the actual sale of the cars. So obviously we can already see that these are significant, the servicification of global value chains can have significant impacts in terms of ending poverty, inclusive economic growth, and reducing inequality. It also has, can have very specific impact, for example, in terms of gender equality, and I'll give you an example later. <clears throat> 
So I want to run through two examples. The paper that is published on our website actually has a number of examples, but be because of time constraints, I'm going to focus on two examples of services that are increasingly important inputs in global value chain. One is professional services, and the other one is aftermarket services. So professional services is a very interesting one because with time, um, uh, we can find that uh, companies can actually find different ways to uh, source uh, these services. They can do it in-house. For example, they can have an accountant, an accountancy department or a legal department. They can outsource it or they can offshore it, uh, more, more often, obviously, to low-cost locations. Offshoring opportunities are particularly important, obviously, for developing countries, because if they have the quality and the communication in place and the infrastructure in place, they can actually be competitive suppliers of professional services. And this is what we see with some of the medical and legal services coming out from uh, India and supplied by the internet or call centers. So this is obviously important because it can have significant levels, a significant uh, impact on productivity gains at the firm level and economy-wide. Um, and I want to give you an example. This is a survey done in 2015 by the World Bank. Um, you can see here the dark blue line are basically firms that are using uh, professional services either in-house or outsourcing them. And the and the light blue line is uh, non-users of professional services. Um, what you see here on the vertical axis is basically the level of labor productivity. And for most of the countries, the users of professional services are significantly more productive than the non-users of, of uh, professional services. So the potential for having an impact on SMEs is also significant in terms of sustainability and sustainable development goals, uh, both in terms of SMEs as providers of professional services and of SMEs as buyers of professional services, hence increasing their productivity. The policy implications are quite straightforward, obviously. Um, in terms of the possibility for uh, firms to be either providers or suppliers uh, of professional services, there are significant investment needs in terms of ICT and education. Um, uh, regional integration across Africa will be critical to increase the trade and the accessibility to professional services, especially in mode one and four, which, were, which is where most SMEs will be able to trade in professional services. There is significant role for domestic regulations in terms of transparency and this simplification, and we know that because sometimes mode four and mode one can be liberalized on paper, but then domestic regulations make it very restrictive to supply this type of services. And then there is obviously a big role for mutual recognition agreements across countries to enable professional services to flow freely um, between exporting and importing countries. Aftermarket services is a very interesting one as well. There are two segments of the aftermarket services that are particularly interesting. One is related to customer care. Uh, which is mostly provided by our call centers, and we know a lot about the BPO industry in countries like India, the Philippines, Costa Rica. In Africa, it's mostly Kenya and South Africa and Senegal. Uh, there are obviously important opportunities for entry in the lowest segments of this value chain, and then with possibility to upgrade into a more sophisticated type of uh, uh, services provision. Um, and then the other interesting segments is the one related to maintenance and repairs. And what is important for African countries is that there are obviously very important locational advantages because these services have to be located within the country where the customer base is, is found. It's a very significant market, and I want to give you an example here. So this is an example from the mining machinery industry. The first column will tell you the initial cost of sale of the machinery, of the mining machinery. The second column will tell you what is spent in aftercare services, in after sale services, across the 30 years life span of a mining company. And that will tell you that basically a, a client can spend up to 35 times the amount initially spent on the equipment in repair and maintenance services. So actually the size, the size of the aftermarket services, it's much more important than the initial sale. And this is why a lot of times 
um, multinationals are happy to give customers a heavy discount on the first, on the initial sale. So this is obviously has important implications for, we are talking about African countries, because if you want to try to localize if you want to try to localize this type of services, there are significant opportunities for skills development and job creation. Um, the BPO segments offer particularly important opportunities for low-skilled and female employment. Um, while the maintenance and repairs is particularly important for youth employment and skills development. Obviously, again, this is linked to very important strategies in terms of investment, in terms of ICT and education, and it's obviously linked to mode three. Uh, because these are services applied uh, linked to the sale of the equipment and the presence of investors in your country. So just some policy conclusions. We know that services impact on the sustainable development goals directly, such as health services or education services. What we have tried to argue here is that the servicification of global value chains, so services as inputs into global value chains, are also very important for competitiveness and upgrading, and can also indirectly contribute to sustainable development goals related to um, economic growth, poverty reduction, and gender equality. For trade negotiators, that means that obviously there is a need to take an holistic view across goods and services because the distinction is not that clear anymore. Um, but it also means that at the sectoral level, there is no one-size-fits-all strategy. Trade policy design needs to be informed by detailed value chain analysis, which takes, in count, uh, takes into account broad stakeholder consultations and the overall competitiveness of the value chain, so the services sector th that matters more for specific value chains. Domestic regulations are very important to ensure access by SMEs, women, and youth. Um, and in the, particularly in the African context, regional integration and regional cooperation, for example, through mutual recognition agreements, are very important to support um, uh, uh, the access to lower cost and higher quality services and export and the trade, export, um, uh, regional trade of, uh, of services. And then obviously there's the big overarching issue of the LDC services waiver and what can be done to ensure that LDCs actually take advantage of export opportunities across, uh, I mean, beyond Africa in, uh, in some of the services critical for global value chain competitiveness. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Judith. Thank you so much. Um, we're now moving o over to, the, uh, to our ambassador, Kao, Moshi Kao. Thank you very much, um, Ambassador, for also for your time. And I think we've heard from both the presentations, uh, from Sherry and Judith, the importance of, of market access for services in the different modes, domestically as well as then internationally. And we're looking forward to your, to your insights into this question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, moderator and first and foremost um, I wish to express gratitude to ICTSD and uh, the Northwest University for having this um, this discussion um, I would want to not my intention is not to repeat what has been said be before but um, just to give a perspective of where um, my discussion will lead into is that um, A number of, you know, in, in the last recent years, global value chains as a framework has gained a lot of traction in the, you know, in, in terms of describing the global production and, and looking at the anal analyzing the, vo the value, the value created along the supply chain and answering some of the policy questions as has been mentioned recently by Judith and, and Sherry. And uh, the, the there's also extensive literature that relates uh, particularly on trade in, val in, in value added, the TIVA, that has, uh, that has argued that services account for much bigger value of the sales or exports when focusing on the value that added. The value addition is estimated at about 40% in the textile and apparel and within the food and beverages. It's not a surprise to the audience here um, in terms of 
how JVCs have continued to be driven by the TNCs that, that, that derive the high-valued services along the, the value chain, as was illustrated shortly by the, the Nokia example. While we find that many of the developing countries, particularly LICs and uh, LDCs, only focus at the lower valued um, activities within the value chain, the bottom of the mm. smiley curve. Mm. So what should an LDCs benefit from LDC, um, from services in, this, in global value chains? And this may address some elements of the very market access issues. In that, firstly, services are key to, structural to achieving structural transformation in line with developing countries' aspirations towards economic upgrading and diversification. And also, as was mentioned earlier, it is about creating competitiveness. Therefore, the quality of <coughs> services, regulations, and institutional frameworks are the main determinants for services performance and are decisive in harnessing the pro-development benefits out of services. Statistics have been mentioned before, and as Angtad had indi indicated, that since nine, between 1980 and 2013, the share of services in gross domestic product increased in all income categories, from a 61% to 75% in developed economies, and from 42% to 52% in developing countries while LDCs still remained at a lower level, maintained 45%. Therefore, it is my assertion here yeah. that um, LICs and LDCs, for them to benefit from services in JVCs, we need to address key concept, the key concept of upgrading along the value chain. <clears throat> and my point here arises from the two points, that firstly, the areas where where firms in developing countries have struggled with the issue of upgrading in their services have related to research and development, product development, marketing, uh, marketing the know-how, and as was indicated also by the previous speakers, technology has also been um, one of the key issues. Secondly, participating and upgrading in, in the GVCs requires access to services inputs which are usually outsourced. And some of these inputs are in, in cared, acquired during exist in, are acquired along the existing um, services where LICs and um, LDCs may not already be t uh, contributing. I will not go into um, more about what is the contribution what is the contribution of services to global exports because this has already been discussed a lot but I just wanted to maybe focus a little bit on one but last point in relation to the LDCs particularly on the services waiver that is in <coughs> being governed within this uh, within this house and focus really on the market, tax, market access issues. Um, I will delve more into perhaps the challenges that, we want, that we, a number of the LDCs have been focusing on. Because as it will be recalled, the, the services waiver was a way of trying to, in, to provide preferential market access for the LDCs in the services sector across the intentionally for all the modes, mm -hmm. but we know that um, there are some modes that are difficult to actually engage on. And this was based on making sure that the preference, the services waiver should go beyond the preference that are already granted within the guts. And in a number of the, the, um, the proposed or the preferences that have been granted under these <laughs> There's very little that shows that it has gone beyond what already is there within, within guards. Therefore, to what extent can we say that the, the LICs or LDCs are, may benefit um, in, from increased market access in that? So 
one may say it's still very limited. But also just to illustrate uh, an another challenge that is being faced, um, and, uh, and it was alluded to even earlier, in some cases, market access is already there for many of the LDCs. The problem is actually utilizing that market access. And the challenge goes back to what I think will be following on, which is about the supply side issues to be able to fully utilize those market access issues. To give you just a quick example, with um, following from granting of the a services waiver. I think it was for a, a Tanzanian psychiatrist who wanted to practice in the EU market. But, and the EU market had already granted the preference that you can be able to, but she was not able to do that because of other requirements, domestic requirements within the EU market. Firstly, she should have a bank account. You should have a residence permit. How do, you, how do you get those when you have not even reached the market itself? Mm -hmm. So these are then some of the challenges that come with, um, where I, I personally have always had a, a view that for many LDCs and LICs, market access is not necessarily the major challenge. It is, it is required, but it is not the major the major challenge. The major challenge is actually being able along, if we, in the context of value chains, being able to upgrade along the value chains, being able to, um, to then utilize the, uh, or be in a position to take advantage of the service opportunities that exist along those, those value chains. And uh, while on that very note, it will, I should also mention that Many of the participation of the LICs in the services sector, you find that it is more on a regional base. And, and therefore, it, those kind of elements that if they can be looked into, you, you know, um, we, we tend to be, th in some cases where we are looking at market access, we are looking at market access of places, of markets that are way beyond even what Smaller, smaller and medium-sized enterprises may be able to actually be competitive. So automatically, you have the market access, but you can't even access the, the very market. So as was mentioned also, challenges that include certification, mutual recognition, also hinders the participation or benefiting from um, from the services, the services sector. So, having touched on those, um, one may try to to, to conclude in, a, in that: How do we then ensure that we better benefit? And um, one would then say that um, it is clear services they have contributed significantly to develop to the development of LICs and, and LDCs, but there is still a lot that can be done and that can be achieved uh, if there is coherence between regulatory and the trade agenda. And these will include also innovative trade and tra trade related policies as was also mentioned earlier on. Again, I want to come back to and re-emphasize the issue of upgrading services activities along the, along the value chain, which will result in growth in domestic production and, in, and, the, trade, and the trade services sector, which in, again, as mentioned earlier on, will lead to um, every, uh, all the different modes benefiting. Um, again, Trade policies and uh, domestic regulations need to be accompanied by policies and measures that address the bottlenecks, the, the real challenges, as I had alluded to, that affect competitiveness and also limit productivity. So, Madam Moderator, when all the above have been addressed, the contribution of services to the overall GDP, um, GDP can also enhance and contribute 
to the attaining of the of the SDGs. We have already it was mentioned earlier on. Uh, um, we could look at SDG one. We could look at SDG eight. We could look at gender. We could enhancement um, of uh, SMMEs. So in general, I would say that it would have, have positively um, benefit everybody. <laughs> so with those few words, I, I thank you very much and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Ambassador Kao. Um, I think you've laid the, the table for, for Deborah to continue in terms of specifically the one comment that you made in terms of the integration of the regulatory and trade agenda. I think that is, is so much important. And then, of course, also the policies that, to address, that have to address these bottlenecks. Easy to say, not so easy to do. Um, but we hand it over in the capable hands of Deborah to bring us some light on, on this issue. Thank you, Deborah. I didn't say I'd provide the answers, actually. <laughs> I'm just going to uh, drop out a few elements and uh, pose a few challenges and questions, actually. Sorry, Volba. Um, OK, so Moshe is, of course, entirely right. We need coherence between the trade and regulatory agenda because at the end of the day, it's all about competitiveness. That's what drives success. You've got to be able to do better than the competition. And we find that the role of regulation in determining competitiveness is really, really significant. Um, for one thing, hang on, I've got to get going here. Et voila. Juanita, help. I'm just going to keep talking in the meanwhile. For one thing, we know that services are very regulation intensive. By the very nature of a lot of services, what um, we call network services, or we call backbone services, or we call infrastructure, these are often in many countries uh, private sector, uh, public sector operated. So road systems, uh, electricity, and increasingly telecommunications and digital infrastructure. Now, when these things are public sector uh, delivered, they tend to be, well, quite bureaucratic, and they tend to have a lot of regulation around them. Even on the private sector side, where we see many professional services, such as medical, financial, um, accounting services, legal services, etc. These come from a history of a thousand years or more of professional standards and private regulation. So that has to be built into a public sector and a public policy objective. So we see that you, you start off in the services sector with a plethora of regulation. And the trick is to say, how do we maximize competitiveness? How do we not limit, how do we play into the trade agenda, but at the same time achieve public, sec public uh, policy goals? These are particularly important on the one side now because we have a global focus on SDGs and sustainable development. So not only the protection of uh, the, the, the sort of rights of the public and uh, public health and safety, et cetera, but the active promotion of goals of uh, reducing inequality, uh, promoting access, achieving gender equity, and all those things have also to be served by regulatory objectives. On the other hand, on the competitive side, we see, and this is another contextual element here, we see the growth of the digital economy. Now, this means that everything has been put into fast mode. And in fact, the pace of change is growing. So the need for regulatory evolution and a very fast adaptability of re regulatory evolution becomes greater and greater as we go. So we're stuck with these two big contextual elements that are shaping how we have to think about regulation going forward. Judith referred to uh, extensively to the role of value chains. Now, this is another big factor. So, you know, you've got SDGs, you've got um, digital economy, and you've also got the structure of business changing. And this also has a lot of implication for services because we need, now need to think about the regulation of services throughout a value chain. So it's 
that regulation obviously directly impacts on the quality and the productivity of services. Regulation directly impacts how a service can be competitively provided within the value chain, but also we have to accept that sometimes we need services as inputs to that value chain. And that's where regulation has an important role to play in allowing access to services where they are required. Again, just to re-emphasize the fact that infrastructural services are critical uh, ingredients in the facilitation of a firm's participation and upgrading within value chains, and therefore, if appropriately regulated, can directly impact on SDG 8, for example, inclusive economic growth, indirectly on poverty, gender, decent jobs, the whole gamut. So the GVCs, I think, really just bring into sharp focus the need for an extremely wide uh, look at, at, um, at services regulation. Now, I just want to pick up Thank you. I just want to pick up one example for, uh, of, of, of where inclusiveness comes into play. And this is around the role of SMEs. We know, because all the stats have been given to you already here, about the, the really prominent role of SMEs in the African economic context. And, I mean, we think that something like, uh, according to the WEF in a 2015 report, I think, 80% of employment in this region is in SMEs. So you've got to think about it. Then there's the role of SMEs in services. Many of those SMEs are service providers. So it's really important to think about competitiveness of those SMEs as an important component of competitiveness of your economy. Their role within value chains, their, um, their, their, their role in, in, um, in just growing uh, employment in the region. This is really, really important. But... So where does this come in relation to regulation? Number one, SMEs are vulnerable. And they're vulnerable in two ways. They don't have clout in the marketplace. So they have to, they can't go and fight for better quality and low cost services. They depend on regulation to help them have access to high quality and low cost services. They can't just absorb unnecessary costs here and there. They tend to operate on the skin, on the bone. So Therefore, regulation is particularly important to them. On the opposite side, the more negative side, SMEs are disproportionately negatively impacted by burdensome regulatory frameworks because they don't have administrative quality, um, economies of scale. You add another round of regulation, another round of checks, you have to do another round of paperwork. An SME is disproportionately affected by that. They may not have the in-house skills to, um, to, to fulfill these requirements and they certainly don't have the economies of scale. So I think it's very appropriate in terms of regulatory uh, development and evolution to think about the needs. And we see here the close relationship to SMEs also. Another example is, of course, and very closely related to SMEs, is to think about gender and regulation in the services context. When we talk about these 80% uh, of employment in the region being in SMEs, uh, an awful lot of that is uh, gender, is, is, is female participation. And um, that's, so also we need to think about how we can have regulations and policies that will enhance, thank you, Wilma, the ability of women to participate more effectively in the services sector, how they can upgrade their services, how they can drive competitiveness through that, through better access to, to the inputs of competitiveness. Um, again, on the negative side, you find that you can have disproportionately uh, exacerbated impacts on the lives of women which negatively impact their competitiveness, but they also can be a very positive uh, impact. So, for example, the improvement of, in regulation and the improvement around transport services in Afghanistan had a very direct impact on the ability of women to access education and to get SMEs going, and this contributes to competitiveness in general. The linkages to education, et cetera, are just obvious as well. So I'm just going to very briefly, because I must give, leave enough time to Sonia, uh, refer to a couple case studies, which in fact Sherry had already uh, referred to, where regulation has had a very positive outcome. The first one being air transport in Ethiopia, where the ratification of uh, the decision on open skies allowed Ethiopian airlines to go to 
really an amazing level of global participation. They now fly to over 56 destinations around the world. And this was around better regulation and competitive practices with independent management. Really a lovely case study. And the other one, of course, being around um, BPO and ICT services in Senegal. So there we saw, for example, tariff reduction of for computer imports, looking at the input side, from 25% to 5%. The introduction of a new telecommunications code. Um, hang on, I need to move this one on, don't I? To, um, to, uh, to liberalize matters, the privatization of a telecom monopoly player, Sonatel, the creation of an independent regulator, you can see where I'm going with this, an amendment of the labor code, and also, and this is something else I'm going to come back to in a minute, the uh, liberalization and the, and the adoption of an investment code. And this, of course, those factors taken together led to an amazing growth in BPO and IT-related trade, 6% annually in a period from 2005 to 2012. You know, basic maths is going to tell you what that's done. And, uh, you know, very briefly there you can see the other impacts on trade. So where are we going with all of this? And really, I'm just going to end with a few challenges on how we think about what is effective regulation. What are the key issues? Number one, it's proportionality. Reduce excessive regulation. You need to have regulation that is just enough to satisfy the public goals you need and the regulatory requirements, but maximize competitiveness and inclusiveness. It's number one. Number two, oh, sure, but I need to move on again. There we go. Number two is transparency. We see that lack of transparency directly adds costs. And if you're in a particularly vulnerable sector like an SME, you simply can't absorb that. You don't have the manpower or necessarily the skills to go and track things down, find out what's really going on, etc. When you publish a thing, it's got to be published, it's got to be open, it's got to be accessible. So we also say that reduced transparency can result in de facto discrimination. And very often that is de facto discrimination that is also counter to our sustainable development goals. So there's a very direct relationship there. Thirdly, the matter of accountability is, of course, critical. We need to have independent regulatory authorities. I referred to this in the case of Senegal. But in all cases, there needs to be independence, there needs to be public accountability, so that there not, cannot be any collusion between big business and the regulator and the this and the that. Get rid of it. All it does is inhibit effectiveness, inhibit efficiency, and undermine competitiveness. But now I'm going to argue that there are a couple more points that we need to be thinking about. The one is regulation needs to consider the SDG perspective as a whole. So regulations need to be gender responsive. They need to think about SMEs. When you develop this, and this is work that uh, ICTSD hopes to continue with shortly, is think about how we can design regulation that will fulfill those objectives with the understanding that in so doing, you're also promoting greater, <coughs> sorry, me, greater um, uh, competitiveness. The second is this dynamic of the digital economy. That And this is an enormous challenge to regulators because, as I referred earlier, the pace of change within the digital economy, the way things have gone is, is making it very difficult for regulators to keep up. Don't have an answer there. All I'm saying is it's a challenge. The third challenge I want to mention is globalization. We talked a little bit about uh, medical services early on. You know, you can have your X-ray taken in South Africa. The X-ray can be interpreted in India, and you can consult the uh, person about the outcome in, let's say, I don't know, Thailand, whatever. Point is, how do you deal with services that can be delivered in this globalized context? And I think there, to get back to something I think it was Moshe said, is uh, we really need to think about different modes of uh, trying to affect re regulatory coherence, mutual recognition agreements, et cetera, et cetera. This is another challenge for regulators, international cooperation. Uh, the final thing I just want to mention is investment. We haven't talked enough about investment here, but the need for coherence between investment practice and investment regulation and regulation of services is critical if we really want to get the kind of supply side capacity 
that we need to have a sustainable, inclusive, competitive services sector. Thank you, Vilma. Thank you very much, Deborah. And again, I think your last comment in terms of exactly what you're saying, to have the necessary supply side of the services um, and the constraints that we are facing there in Africa, specifically um, within the continent and the, the uh, limited um, contribution that service, some services sectors are already uh, giving us in terms of our tra international trade. We know that in goods, the intra-African trade is, is only 10% of all trade in Africa. Um, and, and it would be interesting, given the data limitations that we have, and as we process and go further in, in terms of addressing that challenge, how, how we can enhance the, the intra-services trade in Africa. But Sonia will take us through the, cons the specific the supply side, side constraints and also some policy options. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you, Vilma. Good morning, everybody. And I know the time is running out, so I'm going to try and be very quick um, and move through this fast as I can. Um, I try to just kind of bring into context a little bit the Southern African viewpoint which is also slightly challenging. Um, we, we, have, we have still, in the Southern African context, still got a very large um, un, un misunderstood environment. They, they ne don't necessarily understand the importance of services trade yet, and especially its link with production. Um, we find a lot of our, our Southern African countries battle to understand this linkage, and it's still very unrecognized in the trade policy environment. So the policy environment is not yet conducive to service sector-specific development, and it's very much related to what my other speakers also mentioned about um, this, uh, ensuring that your regulation domestically and your trade policy actually connects to each other. So I will try to make some recommendations, which is quite difficult, but I'll try and highlight some issues. Um, just briefly, quickly, in the Southern African context, we see that services have certainly increased to almost 60% of our GDP on average. Um, but this is interesting that the, the North African averages and East African, West Africa, services as a potential percentage of total exports are in the 20, 25, 26 percent and even more in East Africa. But in Southern Africa, our average contribution to trade, trade is still only 18 percent on average, very low in terms of direct trade. This is not value added. This is just direct trade, which is quite important. In the Southern African sphere, South Africa is the largest player in services trade and Kenya follows after that with, with Tanzania as well. So there's still very small um, activity going on in terms of trade and services, and, and South Africa and Kenya are still dominating the region very much. Um, there's some activities on a regional and global level, certainly, that's happening. I'm just highlighting this quickly. Um, the SADC protocol on trade and services is one I want to recognize because it is certainly now coming to some conclusions, and we hope to see this in action soon. Um, so on a regional level, there's some things happening definitely on liberalizing trade and services in the Southern African region much more. Um, and then, of course, all the talks around CFTA. But there's still this problem of domestic regulatory issues, dom domestic harmonization. So many of the supply side constraints relates to this. Um, Southern African countries tend to be very far removed from the international markets. So for service firms, this causes very high trade costs and low competitiveness. So they need to enhance intra-African trade. We've heard the importance of the regional trade in services. The majority of service firms are small. We've, we've mentioned this, Deborah, very rightly so. Um, and again, there's a limited focus on services in the domestic policy environment and the trade policy environment. And this is very complex. It's very difficult. It's not simplified. Investment, to me, is a very important issue to highlight as well. Um, the investment in the Southern African region is still very much attracted in terms of extractive fuels and mining sectors. And very little goes towards the services sector. And if you really want to enhance your services sector, you're certainly going to have to attract more investment to do so, um, especially for the smaller firms and helping them and training them and uh, uh, skills uh, enhancement and, and know-how transfers. Data constraints and limitations is something that still hinders a lot of Southern African governments to understand really the role of services sector. Um, this is something I cannot highlight uh, more. Um, our data collection of services trade in the Southern African region is seriously challenged. And there are still some serious issues of really understanding the role that the sector plays 
in the Southern African sphere. So to increase trade in services, Southern Africa needs to identify where are we competitive so that we can develop these pro-competitive policies on a sector level. But we need to know which sectors that, that these countries really should focus on. Now, there's various elements, and I'm not going to talk through this as an academic way of looking at competitiveness, is the, the Revealed Comparative Advantage Index that looks at, at, at your relative position in terms of trade and services. And just, I'll, I can explain this to you um, afterwards if you want. But just, and this is a small table, please excuse. I try to fit in a few countries to compare. But in the Southern Africa, region, we still certainly only has competitive positions in terms of travel and transport. One or two countries have managed to increase their competitiveness in terms of insurance and financial services, and the very bottom, which one can negotiate whether this is tradable, is your personal, cultural, and then your government goods services. But there is still a huge gap in terms of development of other sectors in the region. There's certainly potential, but it's not there yet. Um, and, and so this is something that, that I just want to highlight very much. So the challenges really, the governments tend to have little capacity. Um, there's still limited knowledge of services. There's no dedicated directorates or units that really look into service sector trade and understand this play between all the different role players that are involved. So data limitations is a big issue I want to highlight. And there's still little research besides some of the case studies we've mentioned that really look at sector level issues in Southern Africa. Um, there's still also very much a lack of understanding of the link of Southern African services and products and understanding those regional value chains going on. There are some work by the World Bank, but this is still very new work that's going on. Um, and then this inefficient incorporation of services into the trade policy sphere. We are seeing very little focus on services and trade policies, very much in South Africa, that's still the case. Um, and I think in many of our neighboring countries, it's the same story. Domestic regulation is complex, overly complex, and it doesn't necessarily speak to trade policy, trade promotion activities, trade negotiations as well. So we have this, and this is based on a paper that we are working on, on, on really trying to say that governments need to look at this in a Southern African context, and, um, and, and you need to establish some form of larger domestic services focus, either by establishing some sort of a unit in a government organization that many other countries have done. Um, I know of India, Brazil, and many of the Canadian, Canadian services units, and in Europe, there's all these organizations that are established to look really into service sector issues and try and harmonize all these different organizations. Um, in South Africa, on the domestic level, as an example, there's very much these, these, these widespread organizations all involved in a sector such as telecommunications or transport. You have a ministry and you have export councils and you have all sorts of organizations, but they're not necessarily focusing on getting this divide between domestic regulation and trade policy together to understand and how to create this pro-competitive environment. So we really much talk in this, in this paper, which I can share with you later, how to really establish a national strategy to look at enhancing our SME performance and building the sector, and also, together with that, doing more research and analysis of understanding who are the domestic role players and understanding the domestic regulatory framework. From there, you can then also look at trade strategy and look at trade promotion and look at trade negotiations once you actually understand your local sectors better. So this is just a brief idea of what we are thinking about. There are certainly some regional advances in terms of trade and service agreements, the SADC protocol, which is a highlight for me, but there are very much issues at domestic and, um, policy and regulatory environment. Pro-competitive policies are still necessary, and the simplification and harmonization of these regulations are certainly still necessary in Southern Africa. I will stop there in terms of time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sonia. Um, for the sake of time and, and giving us a, at least about seven minutes for some engagement from the floor, um, I'm not going to summarize the, the papers. I think uh, we've, we've get, got the message um, and the overlap was so, so good that I think it's, it makes a good story. Uh, so thank you very much to, to the speakers and uh, I would like to open the floor for any questions. Yes. Bonjour.
Good morning. Thank you very much for this very interesting discussion, and I do regret that there aren't more of us in the room. But in any case, it was very much operational and very close to what we can see on the ground. So first of all, I wanted to ask, what can be the role of regional organizations, in particular in Western Africa, in the development of services? The second question was, do you have any ways that the informal sector can be tackled, particularly in Western Africa, which is the area I know best, and this is a significant issue in terms of regulation, in terms of structure, this really is a problem. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, okay, merci pour cette présentation. Je m'excuse. Thank you for that presentation, and I apologize for coming in late. The question that I am wondering about relates to what was highlighted by one of the speakers. You know that the majority of our companies in Africa are SMEs. So when these SMEs want to integrate into global value chains, there are a certain number of services that come into play. So how do we ensure that these SMEs, which are seeking to access international markets, can benefit from support, often from the public sectors. Often there are SMEs that are performing very well, that are seeking to step up in terms of level and join global value chains, and that's where that problem comes in. In terms of legislation and in terms of the inability to evolve, so what do you see as being necessary to ensure that an SME can benefit, can gain that capability and that capacity to move up the ladder? Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's take these two questions. The first one specifically on, on Western Africa and the regional, how the regional organizations can, can assist in, 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 uh, com in companies wanting to, to join the services, as well as the question on the informal sector. Any panelists that would um, like to, to try to get a go with it? Thank you. So I'll just have a couple of remarks on the regional, um, the regional, the question on regional integration and on SMEs. So I think the region has a, has a very, regional integration has a very important role to play, especially for the smaller economies that can't or don't have the capabilities or the resources to actually set up national regulations. Um, so I think the re regional integration can do three things. The first one is helping in terms of institutional capability. Uh, so helping to draft uh, regulations and helping in terms of regional um, domestic regulations convergence. So convergence between um, regulatory convergence between different countries. Um, the second one is in terms of implementation, obviously, and what we have seen at least in Eastern and Southern Africa is that there's a big role for regional bodies, actually, to take over some of the uh, implementation roles. For example, we see it with the Comesa Competition uh, Commission, where basically, um, to a certain extent, some of these um, functions in terms of uh, 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 regulations and policies related to competition have been basically shifted to a regional body, because yeah, some, some countries will find it very difficult to do, uh, to undertake it at the national level. Um, um, in, terms of the, um, in terms of the SMEs, um, I think the experience of uh, some, some very successful countries actually shown us, have show, has shown us this, um, there's a very important role for specialized uh, agencies to support SMEs. I'm thinking, in, for example, about the Taiwanese uh, example, where SMEs have 
been basically the bedrock of industrial and export competitiveness. Um, and these institutions have been uh, very effective in uh, supporting SMEs' productivity, really, um, with skills development, finance, uh, um, export support, um, etc. So definitely there's a, there's a space for that. Um, and I think um, there are more opportunities now for, uh, for SMEs because of e-commerce. And so governments and regional organizations have, have also to think how they can help SMEs to access customers through e-commerce because obviously it's, it's an opportunity that was not there maybe uh, 20 years ago. Thanks. De Sorry, Deborah, would you like to add? Sure. Just briefly, of course, um, Judith is very right. Regional integration is a, a key way of getting a sort of a certain economy of scale to be able to be more responsive to uh, the needs of, of, of smaller players. And um, also perhaps a way of promoting some kind of policy coherence such that you can have regulation applying across the region ultimately in a way that will also, again, provide a sort of a certain economy of scale. But at the very least, I do think that regulatory development in itself needs to be sensitive and responsive. It needs to be sensitive and responsive to the needs of small businesses. It needs to be sensitive and responsive to the needs to, to, to gender issues. And most of all, it actually also needs to be responsive to the need to formalize the informal sector. Informal sector will always stay at the level of subsistence if we don't find a way to make it easy and to empower these people to be able to enter a more formal sector as a micro-enterprise, later as an SME, to give them a growth traje trajectory. And I do think that we need some coherence of policy across different government departments to help to enable that, as well as possibly uh, specialised agencies and, and such like. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. I think we are um, about to end. Um, I, I'm sorry that we don't have more time for questions, but I'm sure if you have, a, have an urgent question or a prudent question that you would like us to discuss, you can always send an email. Um, we will still be here for a minute or two and can give you some uh, email addresses. Thank you very much to your, for your time and also for the panel of speakers. Um, we, I really appreciate their, their inputs and their presentations and, uh, uh, and also for you to be here at 8.30 this morning. Uh, thank you very much. I hope you will enjoy the rest of the day and um, also um, uh, enjoy the public forum with us for, 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 for to, for today and tomorrow. Thank you very much and if you have to travel, travel safely. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.